Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. In this first part of the lecture, we're going to finish looking at Macedonian imperialism under Philip uh, by taking his reign down to his assassination in 336 BC. That means that we will discuss his settlement of the Greek states and their incorporation into the Macedonian Empire, his plan to invade the Persian Empire, his controversial seventh marriage that led to an open clash with Alexander, and the assassination itself. And then I want to make some concluding comments about his legacy that allowed Alexander to achieve what he did, and we will then move into the second part of the lecture where we talk about Alexander the Great's early uh, years, his uh, youth, and his early kingship. Now, the Battle of Chironea made Philip master of Greece, but that meant little unless he could somehow try to reconcile the Greeks to Macedonian rule. Philip knew that if he were to establish garrisons of pro-Macedonian oligarchies or, uh, you know, in all the Greek states, this would have the opposite effect of keeping the Greeks passive. It would backfire on him. Now, you're probably thinking that given the fierce independence of the Greeks and their attitude toward foreigners, that Philip had as much chance of reconciling the Greeks to Macedonian rule as he had of walking on the moon. And I would agree with you. But one thing we know about Philip by now is that he always had a trick or two up his sleeve. And he'd been thinking of his Greek settlement for quite some time. As we'll see, reconciling the Greeks to Macedonian hegemony didn't mean Greeks living happily ever after under Macedonian rule. But if the exercise of power, that is, who pulled the, screen, who pulled the strings, were masked in some ways, then that would be palatable. Before Philip could turn to a long-term settlement of Greece, he had to deal with those states that had opposed him at Chironia. So after the dust had settled from that battle, Philip negotiated a series of individual settlements with those states. Some of those states he treated harshly, others less so. For example, he dealt with the Thebans first, and he was very tough on them. Perhaps he dealt with them, first of all, because he still remembered his enforced stay in Thebes as a teenager and the way that the Thebans had thumbed their noses at him right before Chironia. Well, what did he do with the Thebans? He installed a Macedonian oligarchy and garrison of soldiers in Thebes. And as a result, a number of Theban Democrats were sent into exile and Theban hegemony of the Boeotian League was taken away. He also ordered the Thebans to pay a ransom for the corpses of those men who had died at Chironia, apart from the sacred band. And he also sold those Thebans whom he had taken prisoner at the battle as slaves, which was actually a common Greek practice. The Athenians, of course, at this point were in a panic. They expected Philip to march on the city almost immediately. Demosthenes, who you see here in front of you, actually took to his heels. Uh, he used the excuse of gaining a commission to obtain grain from elsewhere as a pretext to get out of the city. And we can understand this Athenian reaction, given everything they had done to thwart Philip, really since the Peace of Philocrates in 346 BC. However, Philip treated them leniently, surprisingly. The Athenians did have to dismantle their second Athenian naval confederacy, so that came to an end now. Uh, we have echoes there of the aftermath of their defeat in the Peloponnesian War, don't we, uh, when they had to dismantle the Delian League. But Philip did not march on Attica, as the Spartans had done back then. Um, Athenian democracy, too, was left untouched. No Macedonian garrison of soldiers or oligarchy at all was set up in Athens, as the Spartans had done in 404 BC. No anti-Macedonian politicians like Demosthenes were ordered to be surrendered. What is more, Philip sent Alexander uh, uh, himself at the head of an official embassy to receive the Athenians' oath to a treaty of friendship and alliance that officially ended their second war against Philip. This was the war declared in 340 BC over Byzantium. Uh, now, all of this marks a contrast to Philip's treatment of the Thebans, doesn't it? Um, Alexander, uh, uh, you know, when he when he went to the Thebans, um, 
uh, he did not bring them the ashes of their dead, uh, but he Alexander did uh, bring those the ashes of the Athenian dead uh, to uh, to Athens. He also took the Athenian prisoners with him and he gave them um, free of charge. No ransom was demanded. It is interesting, I think, that Philip himself did not go to Athens, even though he was at war with the city for the lion's share of his reign, and even though he did have an honest appreciation for Athenian culture, um, he did not go himself. And um, we might want to think about why that would be, uh, be the case. Um, this is the only time, incidentally, that Alexander himself will actually even visit the city of Athens, now in the year 338 BC. But why did Philip treat the, the Athenians so leniently? This is not fully known. Um, I do have a couple of suspicions myself, though. First of all, I think we, you know, Philip was such a savvy politician. He understood that Athens would be a natural check on Thebes, which was still a substantial power in Greece. If he treated them both very badly, then they could find common cause against Macedon, you see. But by treating one very harshly and the other one leniently, that created a kind of competition almost, a sort of disparate um, standing between the two powers, and so they would not likely join together. Uh, secondly, there is also the size and power of the Athenian navy. While Philip, Philip ordered the disbanding of the Second Athenian Naval Confederacy, he left the Athenian fleet alone. Philip, by now, was focusing on Asia for his next campaign. Remember what I said before about needing to keep the army on campaign. Uh, and for a campaign to Asia, he would need a fleet. The Athenian one, of course, would make the most sense because the Athenians uh, had the best fleet in all of Greece. And therefore, it made sense to have the Athenians on his side with him as far as possible, rather than be completely against him and resenting him. And so his gesture of returning the Athenian dead and the captives from Chironia would help him there. He didn't need to do that, but he did so. Now, Philip then, after all of these individual settlements with, uh, with Thebes and Athens were completed, he headed to the Isthmus, that is the area between the mainland of Greece and the Peloponnesus. And then he went on into the Peloponnesus to deal with the states there. He made alliances with a number of states uh, in such a way that Sparta, which was always a troublemaker in the Peloponnesus, was now hemmed in by a circle of states allied to Philip. At that point, Philip felt that he could turn to the matter of absorbing Greece proper into his empire, and so it was that in the winter of 338 BC, he summoned deputations from all of the Greek cities to meet him at Corinth, and there he announced his intention to bring about a common peace. Now, a common peace, a koine erene, um, as I've said before, was a general agreement of all Greeks whereby every state individually swore to ally with the others. And this meant that if one were to break the terms of this common peace, for example, by waging war against another member state, then all the other states could take action against it. They could all gang up against it. Now, there had been common pieces before, such as the King's Peace in 386 BC during the Spartan hegemony, which we talked about in a previous lecture. But this common piece of Philip's was utterly different. It was novel. First of all, because unlike in the past, uh, it had those common pieces uh, did not hold up very long, whereas Philip's common piece was an, was an enforced one. He intended it to last, and it was going to last because of two main factors. Each state swore an oath of allegiance not to harm any other member of the common peace, nor to harm Philip, and, and significantly his descendants. No member state could interfere with the domestic or foreign policy of another state, and no member state was to ally with any foreign power that might want to do harm to another state. Furthermore, no state was to do anything that might lead to civil unrest or the un overthrow of its constitution, such as unlawful exiles of people or a confiscation of property. Now, I said there were two things that made it quite distinct. So that's the first one. There was a very much a well-thought-out and long-lasting one. Um, it, it was designed to be a long-lasting one. The second feature that made it different was that there was to be an administrative machinery 
to this common peace that made it look like the Greeks still had a say in running Greece, as if they still had their uh, autonomy. Now, this machinery of administration was a council of the allies under the direction of a hegemon, and each, each state would send a number of representatives to council meetings. The council would administer the league and deal with matters that affected it, uh, all military, financial, domestic, and foreign policy. And the council would also be the final arbiter in settling disputes. Macedonia was not a member of the council, so uh, it was created to be a, uh, a community of the Greeks. In fact, this is the term that was used, the to koinon ton helenon uh, in Greek. But uh, this usually goes by the name that modern historians give it, the League of Corinth, because it was established in Corinth. Now, Philip knew his Greek history well, as I hope we do now as well. Philip knew that an enforced common peace would be a deterrent for hostile action, given the uh, endemic xenophobia uh, that the Greeks had for each other. This is something that we have tracked throughout our entire course. In other words, if one state did rebel from the peace or take hostile action against another state, or if it did something it wasn't supposed to do, like exile people or, or confiscate property, then all the other states would relish their natural instinct to move against it militarily, and they, that move would be legitimate because it would be sanctioned by the terms of the treaty. But Philip also knew that the Greeks cherished their freedom. Uh, hence the reason for why he created this allied council, which on the surface looked, uh, seemed to be able to call the shots in Greece. So it looks like the Greeks still have a degree of their autonomy. The reality, though, was very different, of course, and that is what made Philip's common piece kind of brilliant and certainly novel. Macedonia was, Mac Macedonia was not a member of this common piece, as I said, but gave the power of um, uh, but but the allowed uh, the Greeks to uh, the the Greeks were allowed to have their own kind of uh, council here. Um, but given the power of Philip now, the Greeks really had no choice but to elect him as hegemon of the council. That was what he always intended anyway. And his office of hegemon of the League of Corinth gave him all the real power. We, if we know Roman history, we can certainly make an analogy. To the first Roman emperor, Augustus. Augustus allowed the Roman Senate to meet and, for all intents and purposes, to maintain the Republican constitution, but it was all simply a facade. In reality, Augustus himself was pulling the strings behind the scenes. Uh, so it was here, too, with the League of Corinth. Philip was hegemon of the League. The Greeks might meet together at this council to discuss all uh, issues affecting Greece. They could uh, they could have their, you know, debates and so on, but they they knew and, and they would look to the hegemon for ultimate uh, decision making. The, the deputations from the Greek states returned to their homes to announce Philip's plans, and these were endorsed because, of course, let's face it, what choice did the Greeks have? These same deputations, these same embassies, returned to a second meeting at Corinth in the spring of 337 BC. And it was at this meeting, the second one, that Philip was formally elected hegemon of the League. And it is at this meeting that he announced his grand plan to invade the Persian Empire. We don't know when Philip first began to think about invading Asia, Diodorus Siculus, the historian, says he first thought about doing so in 346 BC, the same year as the Peace of Philocrates. And this statement of Diodorus Siculus has led some historians to believe that the Peace of Philocrates was something like an exit policy, so that the idea was that the Greek settlement in, uh, with the Greek settlement in place, Philip could then return to Macedonia and then leave for Asia. Uh, but that is wrong. And the reason why that is wrong is that Philip had not yet conquered Thrace, okay, the area to the uh, north and east of Greece, the area that is basically modern-day Bulgaria. And he needed to conquer Thrace first to help secure his lines of communication. And on top of that, the peace of Philocrates blew up in Philip's face. It was never going to be a long-term settlement, the sort of settlement that was needed so that Philip could leave Greece behind and move to distant shores and 
not have to worry about the Greeks rebelling against him. The peace of Philocrates was an interim measure, if you like. It was never meant to be an exit plan. Now, the official reasons for invading Asia were pan-Hellenic ones, which is to say ones that were uh, felt to be in the interest of all Greeks. Uh, and those were namely to liberate the Greek cities of Asia Minor from Persian rule, and to seek revenge for what the Greeks, especially the Athenians, had suffered during the Persian War. And let's note once again how Philip was going out of his way to be nice to the Athenians. He wanted to invade Asia on their behalf. Look at that, how nice, seeking revenge for what they had suffered in 480 BC. Again, I think this really was a case of Philip knowing that with the Athenians on his side, the rest of the Greeks would be less inclined to query these pan-Hellenic motives for the campaign. And if I'm right about that, then we do see the influence of Athens on the mainland being emphasized yet once more. The real reasons, the Panhellenic reason, uh, I think is only the official one. It couldn't have been. It couldn't have been the real reason. The real reason why um, uh, Philip wanted to invade Asia may have had simply everything to do with the fact that Philip needed to keep his army on campaign. The revenge motive to an extent with Philip uh, because the Persians helped Perinthus uh, when Philip besieged it in 340 may have been legitimate. You know, that may, the, the idea of getting revenge on the Persians, he kind of had a personal stake in that. Um, but I, I think ultimately, though, another reason might have been also to the need to acquire more revenue, the, the economic factor. Uh, Persia was fabulously wealthy. Everyone knew that. Uh, although the Macedonian king owned Macedonia's natural resources and huge tracts of land by virtue of his office, it is certainly possible that at this point Philip's cash reserves were limited. He had uh, spent a vast amount of money on bribes and the like throughout his reign, so he probably needed money. Moreover, Philip practiced a rolling economy, which meant that he used one campaign to basically finance the next. So he had been bringing home a substantial amount of loot from Thrace and Scythia in 339 that he could sell for profit. But then that group of people, the Trabali, had attacked him and seized everything. And this all meant that there was nothing to sell. So Philip may well have been hard-pressed for cash in 338 and 337, and he may have been looking to Asia to increase the amount of money in the Macedonian coffers. But Philip knew also that the Greeks wouldn't care about all of his problems, so he made the Asian expedition a pan-Hellenic one, building on the revenge motive for the burning of Athens to uh, appeal to the Athenians and uh, the idea, of course, of liberating the Greek city-states uh, in the southwest of Asia Minor that were under Persian control. Whatever the case of, of the motives may be, after the spring meeting of the League of Corinth, Philip returned to Pella to plan for the Asian expedition Later that same year, still 337, he married a young teenage girl uh, named, a Macedonian girl named Cleopatra. This is not the famous Cleopatra, just so we know, okay, uh, who would live many hundreds of years later. The one of Cleopatra and Antony and Cleopatra. This is not that one. Now, this was his seventh marriage. Cleopatra, this Cleopatra, was the adopted niece of one of the powerful Macedonian noblemen who was part of Philip's court named Attalus. Okay. The sources say that this was the only time that Philip did not marry for political reasons, as had been the case with his previous six wives. He, he married this time to Cleopatra out of love, we are told. And that may well be true. But this marriage was virtually on the eve of the invasion to Asia. So here we have to kind of um, think back at some of the things we've learned before. We can't fully discount a political reason for this marriage, even though the sources say otherwise. Alexander, by this point, was 19 years old, and he was clearly the heir designate, the next in line to the throne. He did have an elder brother named Philip Aradeus, who was clearly out of the race, uh, who, as I mentioned before, was in some ways mentally defective, mentally intellectually handicapped, uh, and that kind of basically excluded him from any kind of consideration in the succession. 
Um, Philip may have wanted to, to father another son, therefore, as he got ready to leave for Asia. He wanted there to be another male heir kind of just hanging out there in the wings in case something would happen to him or something would happen to Alexander. Uh, and, of course, there was every chance that something of, the, of that sort might, have, might happen to him. And given the fact that Cleopatra was so young, she's only a teenager, it was very likely it was thought that she would have an heir, that she would have a, a child. Well, now, at this marriage feast between Philip and Cleopatra, uh, Attalus, her uncle, who was now Philip's father-in-law, toasted the couple, as one might expect. But, of course, being a Macedonian wedding, there was lots of drinking. Everybody was pretty much already tanked uh, by this point. And he stood up, and he very insolently in his toast, prayed that Macedonia might finally have a legitimate heir. Now, everybody fell hushed at that point, and Alexander stood up and said, what does that make me then, a bastard, you villain? And he drew his sword and was ready to lunge upon him, upon Attalus, when not none other than Philip, his own father, then drew his sword and stood up and was about to lunge at his own son, when being so drunk, he fell down on the floor and uh, uh, basically made into, was made into a complete laughing stock in front of everybody. And Alexander stood over him and with very uh, taunting words said, Behold, men. This man who wants to lead you from Europe into Asia, and he cannot even bring himself from one couch to another. Alexander and his mother Olympias then fled from the court that night. They left, they went back to Epirus, which of course was Olympias's home, uh, home territory. And it was the area where Olympias's brother, also named Alexander, was king. Um, but Alexander, the son of Philip, soon after this, left Epirus to go to Illyria, which is uh, a little bit f further to the north of Epirus, kind of, um, oh, I don't know, basically modern-day uh, Albania. Um, now, there was a reconciliation of sorts between Philip and Alexander a short while later. And although Alexander returned to Pella at some point, as did Olympias too, bad blood continued to exist between father and son. The situation wasn't helped by Olympias herself, who hated Philip. She seems to have berated him to Alexander throughout his life. Um, and it also didn't help that Attalus was appointed one of the commanders of the vanguard that left for Asia, along with Parmenion and another general named Amintas, uh, who, just for the record, was not the Amintas, who was the heir to the throne in 359. I know this is uh, difficult with all the people having the same names. But if you think this is bad, study Roman history. It's even worse. In the spring of 336 BC, this vanguard, as I say, this advanced force, headed by Attalus, Parmenion, and Amintas, left for Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. The plan was that Philip and the ma main army would join in that summer, Philip did not leave immediately because taking place that summer at Aigai was the marriage of his daughter by Olympias to Alexander, the king of Epirus, not Alexander, his son. Uh, and the name, <laughs> just to make to show you how ridiculous this all is, the name of his daughter, just to complicate things further, was Cleopatra. Um, <laughs> so this marriage of Philip's daughter to Cleopatra the king of Epirus, uh, to the king of Epirus, Alexander, was political. Uh, it was a political one, in the sense that if Olympias had fled to Epirus to stir up trouble against Philip, then it was thought by making the king of Epirus his son-in-law, Philip neatly offset any potential threats from Epirus. A clever move. But the marriage was also meant to be something of a media event, to use a nice anachronistic term, meant to celebrate the power of Philip, the emergence, if you like, of the League of Corinth, and certainly the plan to invade Asia. As such, this marriage was attended by many dignitaries from the Greek states, as well as members of the general public, kind of like the royal wedding uh, that you may have witnessed uh, about 10 years ago or so, maybe a little bit more or less, I don't remember, um, in England. The day after the marriage was... Uh, 
the day after the marriage was turned over to celebratory games in the theater of Aigai. Now, you recall that Aigai was the traditional place for royal weddings and funerals. It was the capital before Pella, uh, established by Archelaus. And these celebratory games started at dawn with a grand procession headed by large statues of the twelve Olympian gods, followed by a statue of Philip that was as elaborately decked out as the others. Then Philip, dressed in white, walked into the theater at Aigai. He walked in either by himself or with his son Alexander and his new son-in-law and Alexander of Epirus flanking him. The sources give both accounts. And if, But if these two men did accompany him, that is, if, if Philip walked in flanked by the two Alexanders, they quickly left him to take their seats because Philip next ordered the royal bodyguard back to show that he did not need its protection. This was meant to be a sign of goodwill, you know, a sign that, you know, he's so confident that he doesn't need a bodyguard. But it was a fatal mistake because as Philip stood there in the middle of the theater of Aigai, facing the cheering crowd, those cheers were the last things he heard because suddenly one of the members of the royal bodyguard, one Pausanias, rushed out and stabbed him to death. He was 45 years old. The official reason for the assassination, as put forward by Alexander, was that Pausanias was an ex-lover of Philip's, who had been unfairly treated by the king. Philip had essentially dumped him for another man, and just to <laughs> make matters even worse, that other man's name was also Pausanias. Now, when the jilted Pausanias uh, complained to Philip, he was ignored, apparently. So Pausanias, the jilted one, uh, Philip's assassin, then complained to Attalus, of all people, we are told. And apparently Attalus threw him out and condoned his stable slaves to gang rape Pausanias. Um, this would have been an entirely reprehensible and humiliating affair, and it was apparently done not just with Attalus's consent, but at his order. So there are personal motives put forward here, according to the official story for Pausanias assassinating the king. There are problems, however, with this version. For one thing, Pausanias was ditched by Philip a year or two earlier before he killed Philip. And, of course, why on earth was Attalus involved in all of this? The time for Pausanias's revenge would have been when he was jilted, not a year or two later, especially as by then, in 336, Attalus uh, was gone, right? He wasn't even there. With uh, He was there, he was on... Uh, it was on march with uh, the advanced vanguard into Asia. He wasn't present at Aigai when this wedding took place and uh, Philip was assassinated. Another problem is that the sources say Pausanias fled to waiting horses, in the plural, that were uh, that he, when he was trying to escape. So if he had acted alone, he wouldn't need the plural, horses. Uh, the truth, of course, will probably never be known as to whether Pausanias um, acted alone or not. He was killed on the spot by other members of the royal bodyguard within minutes. Uh, he was trying to flee the scene and tripped over a vine or something, and the other members of the bodyguard killed him. Um, but we also have to keep in mind, I think, the very real possibility that there is a political motivation for this assassination, and it involved none other than Olympias and Alexander himself. This is the one I personally favor. Olympias, as we've already said, really hated Philip intensely. and But even so, even though there was already a lot of animosity there, this seventh marriage to Cleopatra, and especially the implications of Attalus's prayer uh, that Macedonia might finally have a legal heir, that seems to have made Olympias, Alexander's mother, think, and perhaps made Alexander think too, that if Philip and Cleopatra did have a son, then maybe he would, that son, that is, would leapfrog over Alexander to become next in line to the throne. Of course, that would not happen. That was a nonsensical idea if it did occur to them, since Alexander was clearly the heir designate by now. But at the same time, though, it should be remembered that Olympias was not Macedonian. She was from Epirus, 
whereas Cleopatra was a full-blooded Macedonian, and this meant that any son born to her would be Macedonia, unlike Alexander. If Philip were gadding around in Asia, or if he were to die over there, then Attalus, his father-in-law, who already, as we've seen, disliked Alexander, might have been powerful enough to try to elevate his grandson over Alexander, Philip's son and heir. Moreover, relations between Philip and Alexander had deteriorated dramatically over the past couple of years, and the son's admiration of his father had turned to resentment. Eager for his own military glory, especially after his stunning role at Chironea, Alexander was going to be, uh, was going to be now be denied the chance uh, uh, for further military glory because Philip was refusing to take him to Asia. Uh, uh, Alexander really resented this fact. Okay, he really hated the fact that he was supposed to stay home, kind of on a desk job, essentially, while Philip went on to this amazing historical military adventure in Asia. Alexander used to say to his friends that while his father lived, there would be nothing great for him to achieve. And as we'll learn later, when Alexander visited the Oracle of Zeus Ammon in Egypt, uh, one of the questions he asked was whether all of the murderers of his father had been punished. And this is an odd question, unless there was some suspicion of his involvement in the conspiracy. So Philip was dead. And Alexander became king. Philip was a charismatic king whose merits far, far outweighed his faults, in my opinion. And I would just going, going, I would like to end this first section of the lecture now with some comments on Philip's legacy. It is impossible to describe his legacy as anything but brilliant when you compare what Macedonia was like in 359 BC when Philip became king to what it was like in 336 BC when he died. From a near feudal type of society, Macedonia became the first nation state in Europe. Philip's, Philip left Alexander a united Macedonia for the first time in its history, with an empire stretching from Greece to the Danube, a centralized monarchy, thriving, thriving urban centers, a formidable, well-trained army, uh, advances in siege craft, the sort of army that opened the way for Alexander's great military successes. No external threats to the kingdom. A strong economy. New incomes from, in the form of taxes, harbor dues, and so on, from the areas that Philip had conquered and annexed. The strongest coinage in Europe and general prosperity. All of this and more, however, was not just in marked contrast to the situation facing Philip in 359 BC, it is also in marked contrast to the woeful legacy of Alexander the Great himself. Uh, we're going to ask that question in the coming lectures. Uh, to what degree can we really call Alexander the Great the Great? Um, and I'm going to take the line that he is, he is known as Alexander the Great because of his military achievements. But there's more to being a king than just being a general. And the truth of the matter is that to, to the degree that he was a great general, yes, he was great. But as a king, he was not so great. And therefore, it is in my opinion that it is time for Philip to come out of the shadows of his more famous son and to take his deserved place at the center of the stage of Greek history. The 4th century BC is usually called the Age of Alexander by modern historians. But uh, I follow the tack of Ian Worthington, who wrote a biography of Philip II. And uh, he argues that the 4th century should really be called the Age of Philip and Alexander. Now, in general, I have taken that tack that um, that figures, uh, you know, throughout Athenian history, like Cleon, uh, deserve more credit than they're getting. And I'm basically going to take the same tack when, I, or I, I do take the same tack when I talk about people like Philip II. And as I said, Alexander is somebody who, like Pericles, is in some ways overestimated. Yes, he was a brilliant general and strategist, but he wasn't just a general, though he was a king. 
And when I discuss him in this light, in the, this lecture and in the next, uh, a different Alexander emerges. And as we'll see, it's a very different Greece, especially a different kind of Athens during the reign of Alexander than it was during the reign of Philip, even though Alexander was in Greece for only the first two years of his reign. And so now we are going to turn uh, and deal with the first two years of Alexander's reign to show how he could keep Greece cowed even after he left it uh, and he went as far afield as India. Uh, actually, what is really modern-day Pakistan, but in the ancient world, they knew it as India. Alexander the Great was born in July 356 BC, the son of Philip's fourth wife, Olympias from Epirus. He was not the eldest son. He, as I said, had a brother, Philip Aradeus, whose mother, Felina of Larissa, had married Philip a year before Olympias. Alexander is probably the most famous figure from antiquity uh, after our Lord Jesus Christ. And his history has called Alexander great for many centuries. We cannot consider Alexander's reign in anything like the detail it deserves. And uh, for that matter, uh, there are many um, there are many things I'm going to leave out because of that. Um but I am going to give you a kind of taste and sort of orient you as to his his reign and what the situation was in Greece at this time for the first two years. Um, and we're going to be taking events in Athens down to the, his departure over into Asia um, uh, and the beginning of his great conquest of the Near East. Uh, I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of his reign, okay? Um, uh, but... And if you would like to, uh, and if you'd like to to go further in that reading, I would recommend the book Alexander the Great: A Political His uh, uh, Biography. I'm sorry, a historical biography by Peter Green. This is my. There are many, many biographies of Alexander the Great. Um, Adrian Goldsworthy came out with one a couple of years ago on Philip and Alexander, also very good. But still, though Peter Green's is simply the best in my opinion. Alexander the Great: A Historical Biography. What I'm going to do, though, just in this kind of circumscribed time that we have, is to deal with Alexander in the same way that I've dealt with various other people and things during our course to question, for example, uh, some of his major accomplishments. We've looked at, we've asked those questions, say, of Solon. Was Solon ultimately unsuccessful? We've asked that question of Pericles. Was he not as great a leader as many modern historians think? We've questioned about Cleon looking into the fact that he actually was a pretty good leader, and we've seen Philip II as a great king. Um, I would say, arguably, that Philip was at Macedonia's greatest king and not Alexander. With Alexander the Great, I'm going to address the question of his greatness, because the problem is that it's very hard to get at the real person. Over the centuries, all sorts of stories accrued to Alexander, and the historical king quickly faded into one of legend. He was called great because of his military successes, but over time, his greatness came to kind of ooze over into other aspects of himself as a king and as a person. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to discuss various events of his reign in Greece and in Asia, which I think are representative of him and his reign as a whole. And I'm going to use these as a backdrop to assess whether he still deserves to be called great. Um, now, to look at Alexander's youth, his accession to the Macedonian throne in 336 and the first turbulent couple of years of his reign as king, you would think that Alexander was kind of in over his head. All, But just to even start with his, uh, his birth, all sorts of miraculous stories surround Alexander's conception and birth. And these were designed to show his kind of superhuman status even before he was born. And they'll provide us with some vivid examples, really, of just the sort of problem with studying the reign of Alexander, because it is no, by no means certain that these stories uh, were, um, when they came about, were they circulating at the time of his, in his life or afterwards. Um, it is possible, and I think it's likely, that Alexander maybe put out these stories himself later on to, uh, when he began to believe in his own divinity to show that he was no ordinary mortal from the word go. And we will return to this question uh, in our next lecture. 
But to return to the uh, to the stories themselves, one story has it that the night before Olympias and Philip were married, she dreamed that there was a violent thunderstorm during which a thunderbolt, that is a lightning bolt, struck her in the womb. And this was followed by a blinding flash of lightning, and Philip later dreamed that he sealed up his wife's womb with wax, and that later he saw on the wax an impression of the figure of a lion. It was prophesied that Olympias was pregnant from Zeus, hence the thunderbolt and the lightning, and that she would give birth to someone with the bravery of a lion. Another story is that one night Philip spied Olympias in bed with a huge snake. The snake was Zeus in disguise. This, of course, if you know Greek mythology, was not out of the realm of, of uh, possibility. Uh, the Greeks believed that the gods often popped down to earth and assumed human form and animal form. Zeus was believed to have taken the guise of a snake sometimes when he came to earth. So anyway, soon after this incident, that is after Philip saw Olympias in bed with the snake, Olympias became pregnant with Alexander. And then when Alexander was born, the temple of Artemis at Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, which, is, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, burned down. And it did so, the story goes, because the goddess had left her temple to help deliver Alexander into the world. The magi in charge of the temple, or you know, the priests or whatever, uh, saw something else in the fire that destroyed it. They saw the temple's destruction as an omen that the Persian Empire was doomed to f fall to the man whom Artemis was bringing into the world that day. Well, all these stories are obviously false, uh, but they do give excellent examples of how Alexander saw himself. Regardless of when these stories began to circulate, they were meant to show Alexander was born of a divine father, and that Philip was only his mortal father, not his real one. This is all part and parcel of Alexander's pre pretensions to personal divinity that he would cultivate later. Stories to exaggerate Alexander as a person and his achievements, or indeed both, continued throughout his life. A nice fine example of this was the taming of his horse Bucephalus. Um, which uh, the name means the uh, ox head, uh, uh, presumably because he uh, the the horse had a, a shape of a head shape that was kind of resembling an ox. Um, we are told that when Alexander was perhaps eleven or twelve, the story is not quite certain. A certain Thessalian man brought the horse to Pella to sell to Philip because the horse refused to let anyone ride him, and it reared and kicked uh, anyone who came near him. Philip was not interested in the deal. But the story goes that Alexander saw the horse, and he saw what the problem was, that it was skittish, that it was afraid of its own shadow. And if you just turned it around so that it couldn't see its shadow, everything would be fine. So he came up to the, to the horse when all the other men were afraid to go near it. And he calmly petted it and kissed it and turned it around and then was able to ride it. And, of course, at that moment, Alexander's father, Philip, saw the greatness of his son and said, Son, thou must find for thyself another kingdom, for the one that I will leave you is too small. Um, Philip, apparently in tears, prophesying that his son would go on to do great things uh, and that Macedonia was not big enough to hold him. Well, again, truth or fiction, we know that Alexander did have a horse named Eucephalus which he acquired when he was a young boy. The horse was Alexander's until he died from wounds in the Battle of the Hydaspes River in India in 326. Um, uh, so he lived to be a, a ripe old age for a horse. But whether Alexander tamed him in this way is unknown. Was Alexander really the, the only person out of a seasoned group of cavalrymen, not to mention the horse dealer himself who knew his way around horses, uh, who noticed the effect of the shadow on Bucephalus? So this whole incident could be simply a story put up to show Alexander's intuition and that even from an early age, he was fated to do great things. Alexander was taught to hunt, though, in the traditional Macedonian fashion, to fight, to swim with armor, to ride like other Macedonian youths. Hunting was a major social pastime for the Macedonians. They hunted boar, foxes, lions, and birds. One of the mosaics from the capital at Pella is of Alexander and Crotterus hunting a lion. Um, and uh, 
you can see the lion has the upper hand, or rather upper paw, I suppose, <laughs> because it's in the middle of the mosaic, and one of its paws is on top of the left foot of the figure to its right, uh, and that figure is Alexander. So he's actually trapped by the lion, and Craterus, to the left of the lion of the, on the mosaic, rushes in wielding his sword to try to save Alexander. The mosaic is from the early Hellenistic period, so it post-dates Alexander by a few years, but it is, again, testimony to Alexander's love of Hunt, which continued throughout his reign. It is also testimony to the high quality of Macedonian artistry, especially of the artists who produced mosaics. Uh, there are some really beautiful examples of mosaics from Pella that are uh, still on site there, on the ground uh, in, in houses that are being excavated, as well as some hanging in the museum at Pella. And of course, uh, I would really urge you all to visit Northern Greece and to visit these sites. Pella is spectacular. When Alexander turned 14 in 342, his father, Philip, hired as a tutor the most famous philosopher from the ancient world, Aristotle, foremost philosopher of his day, to be his tutor. Aristotle was already known to Philip because Aristotle's father uh, was the personal physician to Amintas III, that is Philip's father. And after his father died, Aristotle kept in contact with the Macedonian kings. Aristotle himself was of Macedonian origin. And Aristotle would tutor Alexander for three years, not at Pella, but on Philip's orders at Mieza, part of the gardens of Midas on the slopes of Mount Vermion. Exactly why Philip decided that this should be Alexander's boarding school, to call it that, is unknown. But it may have had something to do with Philip's imminent departure for Thrace and the desire to get Alexander away from the influence of his mother, Olympias. Because of Philip's near constant camp campaigning, he and Alexander spent little time together while Alexander was growing up. There is very little father-son bonding time. Alexander came to be influenced greatly by Olympias, who hated Philip, as I keep saying, and who criticized uh, him to Alexander all the time. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. There was a study that was put out a couple of years ago uh, during the Trump period, which uh, analyzed, it was sort of a psychological article that analyzed certain great figures throughout history, whether it was Alexander the Great, whether it was Julius Caesar, Napoleon, uh, you know, all the way on up to the Donald, and uh, and saw that one of the things that they all had in common was the fact that they all had a very, very powerful mother figure standing in the shadows, constantly telling them from the time that they were very young that they were destined for greatness. And that sort of, um, you know, kind of encouragement and kind of instilling inside of a young man by his mother seems to be a very potent psychological force. Um, I, I don't really go into that world too much, but, you, you know, you could take that for what you will. Um, certainly, um, the fact that Olympias criticized Philip to Alexander all the time uh, was was definitely, I think, a very uh, influential thing uh, in his, in his, ultimately, in Alexander's mind. Um, uh, Philip did not know how long he would be in Thrace, and so he may well have wanted to settle his son out of Olympias's clutches, uh, so as to kind of get him away from this constant sort of negative press. Aristotle would have built on Alexander's education by teaching him philosophy, rhetoric, zoology, and geometry. Aristotle had a lot to work with. Alexander was a voracious reader. He uh, already read much Greek literature. Homer was something like a sacred text for him, as it was for the Greeks in general. We are told that um, he uh, Alexander would ultimately take Aristotle's copy of the Iliad on campaign with him and keep it in a box under his pillow alongside a dagger when he went to bed at night. Uh, he also read Euripides, who also spent time at the Macedonian court, but a much earlier date than before either Philip or Alexander. Um, uh, and uh, in 340 BC, Philip besieged Byzantion, as we know, and he needed Alexander back in Pella. Alexander was now only 16, and Philip appointed him regent of Macedonia while he was campaigning against Byzantium. 
Philip also ordered two of his senior generals, Antipater and Parmenion, to stay in Pella, so they were probably meant to keep an eye on Alexander to deal with any trouble that arose in a way that a 16-year-old who had spent the last three years wandering around the gardens talking about triangles or parts of animals with Aristotle couldn't handle. And trouble did come. I mentioned this before. It came in the shape of an apparent revolt by the Medians, a Paeonian tribe on the upper Strymon River. Antipater and Parmenion quickly discovered they were second fiddles to Alexander, because Alexander immediately led an army against these Medians and defeated them. He then moved people from Macedonia into Median territory, settling them in a new military outpost. Um, city would be too much, uh, would be too grandiose if a word here was a military outpost, but he named that military outpost after himself, Alexandropolis. Not bad for a 16-year-old who had been just simply at boarding school with Aristotle for three years before this. It would be only the first of many, many cities that Alexander would name after himself in the coming years, the most famous of which, of course, is Alexandria of Egypt. We don't know how Philip reacted to Alexander's campaign, especially his audacity in naming a foundation after himself. I'm not entirely sure that Alexander's campaign took Philip by surprise, though, because after it, Antipater and Parmenion reduced three other Thracian tribes. So it is possible that all three of them Alexander, Antipater, and Parmenion were following Philip's orders, that is, that they were supposed to engage these Thracian tribes, that there wasn't uh, wasn't just because of a, a revolt, but because this is, was given by the high command. And if that is true, it puts a different light, uh, a very different light, on Alexander's campaign. Um, and that is why I said an apparent revolt earlier. I think it gives us a glimpse into Philip's relationship with Alexander. Um, kind of a, a different sort of relationship of king versus heir. Uh, I think Philip wanted to test his son's mettle in battle to see if he could pull it off, really, uh, even at this relatively early age. Remember, Macedonian kings were warrior kings. Alexander by now was regent of Macedonia. He was the heir of the throne. He'd be the next king. So I think Philip wanted to see if he could fulfill the role as warrior king. But our sources, particularly... Um, Plutarch and others present this episode as kind of that Alexander was getting to be too big for his britches. That is, that Philip was kind of taken aback by his audaciousness and in, in uh, you know going around and you know fighting tribes and s establishing a city after himself. Whatever the case of that may be, two years later in 338 BC, Alexander at the age of eighteen commanded the left flank of the Macedonian army at the Battle of Chironia. He was in charge of the companion cavalry, and we know by now that Philip did not make hasty or bad decisions, and that means that Philip clearly believed his son was up to the job of leading the, the companion cavalry. And as we know, Alexander led the attack that broke the right flank of the Greek line at Chironia, and he and the Macedonians in his force annihilated the 300-strong crack Theban sacred band. After the battle, Philip ordered Alexander to lead the diplomatic embassy to the Athenians to return the ashes of their citizens who died in battle and the prisoners taken at it, and to receive the Athenian surrender. There's no question, therefore, that Philip was grooming Alexander as heir to the throne. But as we talked about in the first part of this night's lecture, after Chironia, relations between Alexander and Philip soured very quickly. Philip's re reaction to Attalus's taunting of Alexander at the wedding feast in 337 and the possible implications for Alexander's succession, should those, that the, the possible implications should Philip and Cleopatra have a boy, that all seems to have upset and worried both Alexander and Olympias to no small extent. Alexander also began to feel marginalized at court because he saw Philip growing closer to the likes of Parmenion and Atlas as a sort of inner circle, while Alexander, although being heir apparent, was very much on the outside of this circle. So all of these things probably combined to turn his emulation of his father as the warrior king par excellence to a feeling of resentment. 
What seems to have been the straw that broke the camel's back was when Alexander discovered he wasn't going to Asia. Instead, he was to have a desk job, as I said before, remaining behind as regent of Macedonia and Greece. It is no surprise, therefore, that Philip needed someone whom he could trust to be in charge of Macedonia, to be the deputy hegemon of the League of Corinth. And a factor in his thinking was probably the danger out to the Macedonian throne if he and Alexander both went to Asia and were both killed there. But Philip's decision could not have angered or disappointed Alexander more. Alexander used to say, as I mentioned before to his friends, that while Philip lived, there was nothing for him to achieve. Philip was showing no signs, though, of slowing down. So who knew what his achievements would be? Who knew what glory he would win for himself? What Alexander did know was that he was not going to win any military glory while sitting around in Pella. Now, this kind of should remind us of Alcibiades in a sense, right? I remember Alcibiades was out to win military renown for himself. He, he knew he could never do this while Athens was at peace. And so Sicily was the opportunity, recall, uh, it was the opportunity Alcibiades had been waiting for, just as Asia was the opportunity that Alexander was waiting for. So as youths, I see a fair bit of similarity between these two men, and, uh, and that may help us in our analysis of them. With all of these factors in mind, therefore, I have no problem in believing that Alexander and his mother played a role in Philip's assassination in 336 B.C., after all, I find it significant that when Alexander left Pella, after Adalus's slur, he went first to Epirus with his mother, but then he went on to Macedonia's long-term enemy, Illyria. Something's going on there. And then in 331 BC, when Alexander visited the oracle of Zeus Ammon in the Libyan desert, as I mentioned before, he asked whether all of the murderers of his father had been punished, and the god said yes. This is a very odd question to ask five years after the event, unless some sort of mud was still sticking to Alexander about suspicions of him being implicit, uh, implicated, you know, complicit in his father's death. Uh, it was just this, this sort of mud that only a oracular pronouncement from Zeus at an oracle could wipe off in people's minds by saying, yes, they've all been punished, you see. That would have been the reason why he would have asked it, not for his own conscience. Alexander was present at Aigai when his father was killed. His friends immediately rushed to protect him, and that was the natural thing to do because of all the chaos and confusion that ensued after Philip's murder. Who knew if Pausanias might have had an accomplice who was out for Alexander as well? But there was no attack, and no attack on the young heir, and Antipater proclaimed Alexander king, which the assembly endorsed soon after. So Alexander became king of Macedonia at the age of 20 in 336 BC. When news of Philip's death reached the Greeks, they revolted from the League of Corinth. Moreover, we are told that not everyone was in favor of Alexander's accession, so perhaps there were possible contenders to the throne. Alexander then had a lot on his plate uh, all of a sudden, so he began to purge all possible opponents, a purge that lasted well into the next year, 335. Having set the wheels in motion for this purge, he quickly buried his father at Aigai and then executed the three sons of the assassin Pausanias, which you remember under Macedonian law was actually not uh, uncommon. That was, in fact, the, the proper legal thing to do. A traitor's family was also executed regardless of whether or not they were in on the plot. Then Alexander turned to deal with the Greeks. Philip had placed a lot of stock in diplomacy, as we've talked about, but Alexander was rather different in this regard, and because he didn't have the time, uh, he really did not have, put much stock in it. Like his father, Alexander used, used speed to surprise his opponents, and within a matter of a few weeks, he had ended the Greek revolt by a combination of diplomacy and force. He did not punish the Greeks, though, uh, but at Corinth he resurrected the League of Corinth, with himself as its hegemon, and the Greeks swore an oath of loyalty to him. He also told the Greeks that he was planning to continue with his father's invasion of Asia. It was during his time in Corinth that Alexander apparently visited Diogenes, the cynic philosopher. 
Diogenes was the man who lived an ascetic life, uh, lived an ascetic life as much as he could, wearing little or no clothing and living in a barrel. Uh, he got the nickname of the dog because he lived like a dog, trying to be self-sufficient and trying to live a life katafuson, according to nature. The Greek word for dog is kuon, and the adjective dog-like is kunikos, and that is where we get the word cynic from. So cynic philosophy, which is what Diogenes practiced, he originated, um, is this kind of attempt at philosophy that bucks all human custom. It, it, it sees nomos custom and phusis as being opposite, one of nature and custom, and preferring the life according to nature. Um, Diogenes was famous, not to say infamous, for his quirky habits. He used to walk through the city, city with a lighted lamp in the daytime, saying that he was looking for one honest man. Um, and when Diogenes met, and well, so when and Alexander met Diogenes, the story goes that Diogenes was sitting there eating some scrappy food or whatever, you know, like you know, some oatmeal or something like that out of a little bowl. And um, and Alexander, in all of his regalia, came up to him, as you can see in this wonderful painting. There's Diogenes in his barrel, and Alexander in all of his regalia. And he says, uh, what is it, Diogenes, that Alexander can do for you? And Diogenes, of course, n refusing to show any respect of persons whatsoever, just looked up and said, you can get out of my light. <laughs> And Alexander, instead of being offended at this, was so impressed, actually, by his chutzpah uh, that he said, I, if I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. Uh, or I would want to be Diogenes. Alexander then returned to Pella after the resurrection of the League of Corinth. But before long, he was involved in a campaign against the Tribali. His motive was perhaps revenge for the defeat that the Tribali had inflicted on Philip in 339. Uh, you recall, this was the battle where Philip was severely wounded in his leg. We should not rule out, though, another motive, perhaps. Alexander, as king, wanted to win the confidence of his army in battle. He wanted to lead his men in battle for the first time as king, and so the campaign against the Tribali was a perfect opportunity for that, and he was successful. Uh, but while it was going on, the Illyrians revolted, and they prepared to invade Macedonia. Sounds like a crack record, doesn't it? Alexander immediately led an army into Illyria, and he was gaining the upper hand against the Illyrians, when he received word that the Thebans had revolted again. Uh, now, after the Battle of Chironia, you remember, Philip had set up a pro-Macedonian oligarchy in Thebes, supported by a Macedonian garrison of soldiers. It appears that a group of Democrats who had been exiled at that time returned to Thebes in 335, and they persuaded the people to overthrow this oligarchy and to besiege the Macedonian garrison at Cadmea, which is the Acropolis of Thebes. They then called on the Greeks to, arms, uh, to, to raise arms against the tyrant of Macedon. There's also the likelihood that the Persian king Darius III had sent money to support a Greek revolt. And if this is true, he obviously wanted to stop Alexander's invasion, which he must have been taking seriously, and with good reason, as we will find out in our next lecture. The Theban action was a serious threat to Alexander, and it was one that he could not ignore. It had the potential to bring in other Greek states, and in Athens there, were, there was some debate in the assembly about supporting Thebes, but in the end the Athenians did not support Thebes. Moreover, the revolt was go also going to delay Alexander in invasion, invading Asia, and this annoyed him so greatly uh, that um, patience was not one of, one of his virtues, that he uh, immediately broke off the Illyrian campaign, and he took some 30,000 infantry and 300 cavalry and marched south to Thebes and Boeotia. And he marched there at such speed that he covered the 250 miles in merely three, 13 days. So that's really motoring given the rocky terrain. Of course, there were no tunnels through the mountains or modern roads or anything like that. So uh, Alexander marched so fast that the Thebans at first did not believe that it was him before their gates because he had come from Illyria so quickly. But Alexander gave the Thebans one last chance to surrender. And when they did not, he besieged the city. 
After some initial reversals, Thebes fell to Alexander, and during this time some 6,000 Thebans were killed and another 30,000 were taken prisoner. The Macedonian losses numbered only around 500 men. Then Alexander turned over the punishment of Thebes to the League of Corinth. Of course, he turned it over to a handful of states, members of the League of Corinth, that had suffered terribly at Thebes' hands, and so therefore were relishing the moment to take uh, you know, bloody vengeance upon the Thebans. Um, uh, these states, of course, knew what was in Alexander's mind, and they also knew how they could have their revenge on Thebes, so they ordered the total destruction of the city. Um, and we were told only that the house of the poet Pindar was left standing. Okay, this little house that had been there of the uh, much earlier poet Pindar. So what Alexander was doing basically was cynically exploiting these members to, to make it look as though Thebes' destruction was a unified action of the League, a decision of the League, and had nothing to do with him personally when in fact it did. The message, though, from the raising of Thebes was clear. Defiance of Alexander would meet with terrible consequences. And this is echoed in the ancient sources. For instance, Diodorus Siculus says that Thebes' destruction, quote, presented possible rebels among the Greeks with a terrible warning, end quote. And that did the trick, because in 331 BC, Aegis III of Sparta tried to unite Greece against Macedonia, and he failed dismally. This was the way that Alexander kept the Greeks cowed, even when he was away campaigning in Asia, as far east as what the Greeks would call India, but it's really Pakistan. Those Greeks remembered the destruction of Thebes, and they did not want that happening to them again. And so it was that with Greece finally secure, Alexander could plan for the invasion of Asia, and he extend, intended to invade Asia in the following spring. In the meantime, the last of his opponents, real or imaginary, was put to death. Among them was Amintas, the true heir to the throne in 359 BC. He, he's been, you know, hanging around all of this time, and now he's finally out of the picture. Another victim was Attalus himself. Attalus, of course, the uncle of Cleopatra, the seventh wife of Philip. Alexander sent a letter to Parmenion, who was still in Asia with the vanguard force, and this letter contained orders for Parmenion to kill Attalus. And Parmenion did this as soon as he read the letter. So Alexander finally got his revenge on Attalus for the insulting comments he had thrown at him on uh, and his mother at the wedding feast of 337. It is interesting, I think, that Alexander spared his half-brother Philip Aridaeus, the son of Philip and Philina of Thessaly. And Aridaeus continued to live at court and didn't give Alexander any trouble at all. Um, we will... He will make one small little appearance, almost kind of by accident, at a, at a, after Alexander's death. A lot happens, therefore, in the first two years of Alexander's kingship, and there is even more to come. Over the winter of 335 BC, Alexander fine-tuned his plans for the invasion of Asia, and in spring of 334 BC, he was all set to go. He had already proved his battle prowess in Greece, but that was nothing compared to his spectacular victories in Asia. And so in our next lecture, we are going to turn to those victories and his generalship. Um, and But for the rest of this one, what I would like to do is look at the first hour or so of a one of two movies that are really the kind of most famous movies about Alexander the Great made in the English language. The first of them is from the 1960s, starring Richard Burton as Alexander. The second is far worse as a movie. <laughs> it is the Oliver Stone uh, 2005 movie, or I think that's the year 2005, uh, with, with uh, Colin Farrell, um, simply called Alexander. And uh, we will look at the one good scene from that movie in our next lecture. But for now, I'd like to take a look. Basically, it will sum up all of the events that we've been learning about tonight, um, and we will, we will put a bookmark in it after Alexander crosses over into Asia.